Welcome to The Contemplative Life. Three pastors, friends, and spiritual companions help us explore spirituality through a contemplative lens. I'm Christina Roberts. I'm Chris Roberts. I'm Christina Kaiser. We're glad you joined us. Well, hello. It is great to be with you. Uh, Today, we'll be talking about this idea of second naivete. And we've mentioned this idea before in our podcast, and it comes from the philosopher Paul Ricoeur. It's the notion that we can experience something in our lives and walk away from it. However, later we return to those same experiences and beliefs with fresh eyes and a new take on them. And this is common for people who find themselves questioning aspects of their faith or spirituality. We can have seasons, maybe years of disengaging practices and ideologies that no longer serve us. And then we find ourselves drawn back to these practices in new, fresh ways with more of a mystical approach, uh, viewing it with fresh eyes. Yeah, I'm continually experiencing second naivete in my life and specifically, you know, revolving around prayer. So when I was studying back in the day, I spent an entire semester taking immersive courses on prayer. And the way that it was designed was we would have a different prayer leader from around the world that would do a week of lecturing. And then we had practicums that we had to do. And so each one had their specialty. Like one person would talk about praying for leaders and she really emphasized prayer list and someone else talked about music and prayer. But one of the topics was on what they called spiritual warfare. And it was basically this idea of darkness, evil, and that, you know, we can pray against those things. And they would often quote verses like, you know, we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spirits and things like that. And so as I have grown in my faith, I don't really resonate with battle and warfare type of languages. So I think I've kind of left some of those teachings behind. And yet in recent weeks, and even particularly this year, with all that's been going on in our in our country, in our world, This idea of darkness is very real in people's lives and sort of personalized evil and and feeling kind of yuck or blah or oppressive. And so I was talking to my spiritual director last month in, in my session. She's a Catholic nun. And she was talking about this prayer that she does, which she calls a prayer of light. And she will just picture people in her mind and call them by name, immersed in light and praying for light to flood them. And I just thought, oh, like, I really appreciate that because instead of having to pray, quote, against the dark or against these things, we can pray in light. And so I think it just got me thinking about some of these prayer models that I learned about when I was, you know, 19, 20 years old and how they fit into my life now and how the contemplative maybe is helping me to re-engage with some of this in some fresh ways and to recognize that there is something there. You don't want to throw everything out, but how to maybe reframe that through a contemplative lens. This is such an interesting conversation, and I feel so attached to it on the inside (laughs) because I think I did come into my adulthood in this Pentecostal way. And so, yes, lots of teachings, lots of here's how to pray, uh, lots of check-ins with people, uh, and, which were, were always a little shifty for me, a little uncomfortable because I, I am also a performer. Like I went to school for opera, and so if someone, if I knew someone was going to ask me a question, they were going to follow up about how I was feeling after prayer. Um, I, I had that. I was on edge about what I was going to say. Uh, so similar to you, Christina, I have found uh, prayers with fewer words have really helped me engage in a more serene space <laughs> about uh, prayers for healing and this kind of things. And, and I have other friends similar to you who have said, oh, the battle language doesn't um, doesn't resonate with me, which, I mean, I'm sensitive. I'm sure the battle language resonates. I mean, I don't mind it. I don't mind a little bit of stomp on the head of the enemy like every now and again. <laughs> you know, it, it soothes the soul in a particular way. But on some days, I do find it helpful to be able I think I first saw it in Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership, where they talked about intercession 
and just sitting in the presence of God with that person in mind. So very similar to what you're saying. And I thought, oh my gosh, is that possible? Can I really just sit in the presence of God on behalf of a person and, and let God's work do it? That I don't have to have all the fancy words. It changed my life. It has so changed my life. So this is a great conversation. Yeah, I love uh, what you guys are bringing up uh, as specifically as it's related to prayer. And I think what comes up for me, uh, I grew up also in a Pentecostal assemblies of God, non-denominational type of faith background. And this prayer with speaking in tongues was huge for uh, the faith background that I was raised in. And so uh, for those that don't know what speaking in tongues is, you know, it's taken from the book of Acts where, you know, they spoke in tongues and it's this groaning and utterings. And so, you know, my faith tradition, people who would speak in tongues were like super spiritual. They had a lot of faith, you know, they were stringing these incoherent sentences together. And now I don't doubt that God would, would see their heart in what, what it is that they're saying or you know, like some sort of communication between them and God took place uh, because I think my view of God has expanded that he can encompass that. But I think one of the things that I've been returning to this whole notion of whenever we feel something so deeply or something in our life is happening and we just don't have words for it, this idea of groaning, of letting out this like help or be with me. I think I've talked on the podcast before about prayer beads and I've been using prayer beads as because I mean, I just, I find that words don't really serve me um, that come from me. I really appreciate words. I'm, I'm into poetry and things like that. And they speak to me, but as far as my own personal uh, prayer practices, I, I really resonated with prayers of silence, prayers that embody things, you know, like the prayer beads. Uh, I think prayer can be embodied in, in going uh, through a rotation with my prayer beads and, and just the, the movement. And a lot of times I, I find that I don't know what to pray. And particularly like the past couple of weeks, I've had some situations, you know, I have my traditional view of how I would respond in a situation but it has affected me so deeply. The, the interactions that I'm having with others, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to be triggered emotionally. And so I've been groaning in prayer and I've been doing that, you know, with my prayer beads and with guitar playing or doing things with my hands. And so I re I've really appreciated going back to this notion of, uh, of second naivete in my prayer life. Uh, and it's been super helpful for me this week. So I really appreciated the contemplative approach to viewing something with fresh eyes. Yeah, I like what you're saying, Chris, about kind of going to the essence. So there's the act of quote praying in tongues that your faith tradition celebrated when you were younger. But the essence is what do we do when we don't have words to pray is what I think I'm hearing you say that the, the core of that is this, I have these deep things going on and I don't know how to respond to that. And I think that's what I'm, even with the quote, spiritual warfare stuff too, what is it the essence of that? That there is evil, darkness, oppression in the world. And I think that we can all agree with that. And so what does it mean to respond to that? And so I think even that second naivete inviting us to go back to the core, maybe we can shed some of the layers or the expressions of that and to, to get to the core and then find our entrance points. And I think even for me, learning from other faith traditions has been helpful. So even you bringing up the groaning, I'm thinking of a seminar that I just heard where it was, um, it was interfaith and there was a Muslim woman who was describing this, um, and I, I'm not exactly sure what the holiday was, but there's this, this lament that um, she was invited to do. And so this was in London and it was outside and she was singing these songs of lament, but she wasn't singing words. It was this, I don't know what it was. It was this sort of phrase or utterance that she did as a way to lament for what was going on in that particular Muslim holiday for her. And I just thought that was beautiful. And she sang a little bit of the chant for us on the, on the screen, what it was a zoom call. And it was just this lovely moving and, you know, she's not going to call it praying in tongues or whatever in her context. But I think that essence of as humans, we have things that are deep, which is why we cry sometimes or, you know, we oh, we sigh. We, you know, we, we just don't know. And so, you know, I think kind of getting to the core of these things is possibly what Paul Ricoeur is inviting us into 
with the second naivete. There are these conversations around the whole self getting involved, right, in the contemplative. And so I like what you're saying. I feel like it pulls in that notion of the whole self. And there are so many different contexts of this groan. I feel like Barbara A. Holmes talks about the ring shout, kind of like this ginormous out. And Martha Beck, in one of her books, even says, uh, if you can't laugh, cry or yell. <laughs> it's just this whole body. So I, and I especially like, right, so these are shouts, crying and yelling are all very, but the sigh is a different space yet, uh, which seems also very necessary. In this Journey to the Heart book, they talk about even the Martha Mary, right? So as we kind of reimagine and we think about both the yelling and the screaming versus the sighing, uh, Martha often gets a bad rap, right? <laughs> and uh, both Richard Rohr and this other book I was just referencing talk about like the wholeness. Like if we are busy, can we also embrace our less busy side? And if we have this emotion, can we also embrace this other emotion that's all a part of us? Right. Like not even to reject all the other stuff necessarily that we talked about, but to like, here's a part of who I am and here's a part of who I am. And I need all of these expressions in order to, you know, communicate with God <laughs> to work through. Yeah. And even you talking about shouting, I haven't thought about that in a while, but in, in my studies, that was part of the spiritual worker unit was shout to the Lord. There's these Psalms and we would do these declarations of shouting. And so again, I haven't shouted prayers lately, but I hear what you're saying that sometimes there's an intensity and that release of like, you know, in, in your car screaming or in, you know, in the woods or in the shower or whatever, where there's this outlet of something that you have to, to release. And so again, if I'm hearing it from a more invitational, almost human, like as a human, I have these needs that I am trying to communicate to God and it feels intense. I don't know. To me, that feels again, like a second I have attained versus singing these songs about shouting to the North and the South and this declarative thing, maybe it was fine. And, and I'm sure I got something out of that at the time, but maybe moving past that. So I think, yeah, that's another great example of some of these more expressive type of outward prayers and, and how do we recontextualize those things? Yeah. And I, I have a wonderful memory of whenever I was, I think six or seven and my, my grandparents took me to this, um, this native American, I, I believe it was Cherokee, uh, tribal dance in the mountains. That was probably about an hour and a half away from us. And, uh, I, I remember being in, in the car or sitting on the back of the car with my grandparents, my grandfather supposedly was half Cherokee Indian. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting on this, uh, on the back of the car with my grandparents and I'm watching this tribal dance happen. Um, you know, and they're in their traditional, uh, outfits and, and they're dancing around in the circle and there's these noises, you know, they're, I, I don't know if it's their language, but uh, I mean, for, for dumbing it down, you know, hoya, 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 you know, the, the thing that you hear on television, I was, you know, brought up on Westerns and I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm seeing it in television shows and I'm actually seeing it in real life, but I can, oh, I can, I can remember an overwhelming sense of like, a, uh, like having a spiritual encounter at this, at this tribal war dance. And it was a, it was a good spiritual, like, I felt like, wow, these people are, um, these people are interacting with each other and they're interacting with, with the divine in a way that's drawing me into uh, the prayers that they're praying. And uh, I thought that was a, a wonderful experience. And I'm so glad that we're having this conversation because I don't know that I've thought about that in, you know, 30 or 40 years. Uh, but I'm also like struck by this whole idea of evil, right? I, I think growing up in a culture where we can explain away everything, I, I think returning to not saying that there are demons or spirits behind everything, but you know, like I've I've really come into contact with a lot of young people that are that are experiencing darkness in their mind, right? These these thoughts of Am I good enough? Uh, am I going to be loved? Am I going to be welcome? You know, I've I've really seen this play out over the past month, and I, I believe that's darkness. And you know, it, it could be uh, it could be in the music they're li they're listening to. It could be in books that they're reading. It could be in certain websites that they're searching. But I think I've also 
thought about, okay, returning to this notion of evil or darkness uh, in, in a fresh way, um, that, that's been helpful for my life uh, over the past couple of weeks. So I've really appreciated this conversation with you guys today. Well, this is the part of our podcast where we talk about what we are into. What are we into, guys? Well, I recently became the owner of an ice cream maker, and so I am just thrilled. We are going to make ice cream and sorbet and sherbet. We're going to make all the things. Like I'm going directly to the store to buy all the things. So ice cream makers are my thing. (laughs) That is awesome. I have loved making ice cream in the past. And so if you need tips, like, do you want to make ice cream or do you want to make custard? Right. I know. I don't know yet. Use some egg yolks, you know, thicken it up. (laughs) So that's awesome. Well, I have been into, I guess, carpooling. (laughs) I've been, I've been hauling my daughter and her friends around uh, over the past couple of weeks going from this location to the next location, but most of it is centered around uh, rowing and the the sport crew. And so they've been going out on the lake and I've been a parent that's been helping them put this, it looks like a Viking longboat, but it's an eight person uh, boat that they, they use for crew. It takes about 12 of us to get it out onto the water and then they go out for like it takes longer to get the boat on the water than I think that they're actually out in the water. Uh, but I've been into carpooling my daughter and her friends and crew for the past couple of weeks. So maybe I will jump on the custard bandwagon. I have been into Ted Drew's frozen custard, which is a staple in St. Louis where I grew up. And um, we're leaving Friday to go to, by the time this podcast airs, we will have already been to St. Louis and I am planning to take my kids to Ted Drew's to get some custard. It's a whole thing. It's an outdoor thing. There's lines everywhere. People stand around the parking lot and eat their custard. So it's not just the custard itself, but it's the experience. It's on Route 66. So I am into Ted Drew's frozen custard. Nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us. For more resources, we invite you to check out the contemplativelife.net and we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great week. Mm-hmm.